Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Hey everyone, welcome to episode seven of the Canine Culture Podcast. Today we have a special guest and her name is Dr. Haley. So Dr. Haley, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, I'm glad to be here. So tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do. So um, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I went to undergrad and veterinary school at LSU in Baton Rouge. Go Tigers. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And um, after vet school, I moved um, with my boyfriend at the time, now husband, who was in vet school with me uh, to where he is from here in Southeast Texas. So now that's where I'm practicing. Awesome. So uh, it's funny you talk about Baton Rouge, and Louisiana, and New Orleans, all of that this time of year. Uh, I had my first king cake last weekend from my friends that live in, they've lived in Louisiana their whole life. So we went to visit them over in Tampa and they were like, oh, we have to get a king cake. And I was like, oh, I've never had a king cake. So she had, she had some like flown in, she had some local and I had to try them all. They were all good. I mean, <laughs> I have to say it can, it can be life changing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite? <laughs> so one was very lemony, and one was very like cinnamon bun e. So they were different. So I liked them both. Yeah, there's there's tons out there, and I mean, you'll if people in Louisiana go crazy about it. My personal favorite is going to be at Keller's Bakery in Lafayette, Amaretto Walnut Cream Cheese. Just got to give them a shout out. <laughs> I feel like I've heard of that. I think that my friend told me about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So back to dogs. So anyone listening, that was just a little piece on cake. You're welcome. Yeah, um, guys, you feed it to your dog. <laughs> right. Exactly. So what, uh, what does your practice look like? What do you do as far as a vet? So I work at a general practice um, in Lumberton, Texas. It's Main Street Veterinary Clinic out there. Um, and it's it's going to be, I mean, your, your typical vet practice. We, we see wellness, we see sick pets, anywhere from, you know, the minor cuts and, and scrapes and ear infections all the way to emergency sometimes, you know, emergencies don't wait. <laughs> so we, we will get those. Um, and it's pretty well-rounded. I mean, um, we do surgeries, you know, the whole whole nine yards. And uh, so today's episode, we're really going to talk about acupuncture for dogs. So what is your role at the clinic as far as doing acupuncture? Are you the main acupuncturist? So I'm the only vet there that does acupuncture. Um, I'm the only one that is in the course certified to do it. Um, and you actually, to, to be able to do acupuncture on animals, you have to be a veterinarian. It differs a little bit from human medicine in that way, because you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to go to to medical school to do acupuncture on humans. Whereas in, in vet med, you, you do, and then you can, I mean, you, you technically, I think in some States you can technically do it without being certified, but you, I mean, you're going to want to, you're going to want to get certified to, to know the specifics, to know what you're doing really. Um, and, and then to be able to practice it. Okay. So I actually didn't know you had to go get a particular certification. So what does that kind of process look like? So there, there's a few different, um, places you can get certified, um, as, as a veterinarian. And I went through the Chi university, which is actually in Florida. It's in Reddick, Florida. And I did the I did the certification while I was in veterinary school. You can be in veterinary school. You can also be out as a practicing vet to do it, but you have to be one of those. And it it, it was over the course of about six months, and it entailed a few different sessions. Some that we did online, you know, just courses that were pre recorded, and then a few sessions. I want to say it was about three, I believe, that we went 
out to, to the um, school in Florida and did labs and lectures and everything and learned how to, you know, put needles. And then we actually have to go through and do a test um, that is a lab where we actually show where 20 points are out of the, it's like 200 and something that we learn and then also answer about 200 question tests. And then we have to do a, um, a case report afterwards. So it, it, it does entail a lot. It's, it's a lot to do during school for sure because it's kind of like a whole nother course. Um, but, but yeah, it's very fulfilling, definitely. So what drew you to do that while you were still in school? Was there something that you took in a class or something that came up and you were like, you know what, I want to get certified to be able to do acupuncture? Like what, what drove you to do it? So LSU actually had a a really good integrative medicine program, which um, integrative medicine, it gets the, the term from integrating both Western and Eastern medicine, um, which we can kind of touch on in a little bit. Um, But I I actually had an older dog whenever I was in veterinary school. It was a Weimaraner that was about 13 or so whenever I was probably in second year of vet school. And he he had some arthritis and, and things like that. And I was introduced to the integrative program and I saw what it could do for him. And I, I just knew that I, I wanted to be able to bring that to my patients because I saw how good it was for him, how good it made him feel. And honestly, how good it made me feel too, you know, just being able to practice that with him was, was really rewarding. Right. Yeah. I totally get that. So one of the reasons I was driven to do this podcast Um, we were talking about before we started recording was uh, we had a 12 year old Pomeranian diagnosed with cancer. And um, I had someone come to me and they're like, you should, you should take her to acupuncture. And I was like, that, that doesn't work. That's not real. That's very woo woo of you. Uh, But then it got to the point where I was like, you know what? Might as well. We're doing chemo. We're doing radiation. We're on a keto diet. Let's try something else. So I took her in for a first session and she wasn't sleeping. And so I said, Hey, she's not sleeping. And whatever they did, she came home and slept for like eight hours straight. And I was like, there's no way that it worked that well. So we went in again. I want to say it was a week, maybe two weeks later. And I said, Hey, she's not eating. So they did, you know, whatever it is that they do. She came home and she ate immediately. And it was wild how great it worked. And Uh, we take our two seniors to acupuncture. Now we have a 13 year old and 11 year old and they both have arthritis. Um, Titan, our 11 year old has neck and like lower back problems. He has a couple of bulging discs. Um, Stony, her entire back is a disaster. Like anytime she gets a new vet and they look at x-rays, their first question is, can this dog even walk? And I, I think I can attribute a lot of her energy and her running and her activity to acupuncture. Uh, we go regularly and they also, they pair her with um, the red laser. I don't know if it's the red light laser. It's just a laser for like inflammation. Yeah. yeah and then, yeah. And then she, um, she also does physical therapy. And so we also have like homework at home for physical therapy. Um So for anyone listening, how would you define acupuncture for dogs? Because I know some people hear the term acupuncture and different images come up or they just, they don't really think of it as like medicine. So how would you define acupuncture? So, I mean, the very literal sense of it is, is going to be the insertion of very fine sterile needles um, into specific points on the body in order to induce a therapeutic response and that it can also be altered or you can add to it by doing electrostimulation or moxibustion or you can also laser acupoints if they're really not tolerant to needles Um, they're basically just a stimulation of those specific points is, is what it is And the way that you formulate the plan of what points you're going to use is where that, that medicine and that, I mean, basically your diagnosis and your, your treatment is going to, your treatment plan is going to come from. So it, it involves more than just sticking needles and blindly in, in different spots. You, you really tailor your, you have to diagnose the patient to begin with, you know, Mm -hmm. right. Um, And the way you diagnose them is using a traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. Um, And and that will help you kind of formulate your points. 
So that's, that's where that integrated medicine comes in is because your traditional Chinese veterinary medicine is gonna be your Eastern medicine. And we don't like to say, oh, we're, you know, we're, we only accept Eastern medicine. It is, you know, the rule because a lot of times that's not it. You know, you, you, you were just saying that, you know, your, your pet had cancer, was seeing oncologists and acupuncture was what you were using also. Mm-hmm. So you're integrating those, those two aspects and kind of tailoring it towards your patient. And the diagnosis part is what's so fun about it. Um, it's, it's kind of, kind of goes off into a different, a, not a totally different subject, but you, you have to, it's all about chi and your yin mm-hmm. and your yang, which we can kind of break down. Um, if you want to, to kind of get an idea of how you, you come up with these diagnoses. Um, but it's fun and it is ultimately medicine. And I do think that it, it really helps to tailor that treatment to a specific patient. So talking about diagnosing your pet. So when we were at the acupuncturist, maybe three weeks ago, I told them that Titan was a little more aggressive lately. And they said his, one of his chakras was blocked or off. And they were able to tell that from his pulse and the color of his tongue. Yeah. Um, And I found that really interesting because I mean, had they not been trained in that, they probably would have never even gone down the path that we did go down. So they did acupuncture on particular spots. And then um, we, they actually sent us home with a Chinese herbal formula that I think we're going to have to up it. They gave us like the smallest dose and we're going to up it. I think it's called Happy Wanderer, maybe. There's li- I know there's liver happy. That that one's like a really, really common one. And a lot of times that aggression is, you know, has to do with, with liver in the traditional Chinese veterinary medicine um, world. But it's probably similar. Yeah. So, um, kind of talking about while we're in the diagnosing phase and all of that. So what does acupuncture treat or what do you try to treat with it? If you're diagnosing a patient, uh, what are some different, a, what does that diagnosis look like? And like, as far as what you're looking for and then B, what are the things that you're treating with it? Sure. So, um, the, the diagnosis part, what, what's really cool about acupuncture and, and like how they, they diagnose your pet, you, you could have two, two pets with the same exact diagnosis in Western medicine, let's say a bulging disc, you know, mm-hmm. two pets have the same thing. Your diagnosis in traditional Chinese veterinary medicine could be two completely different diagnoses for that pet because it's tailored to that pet. And um, the, the blockage that they were likely talking about, um, is a blockage of chi, which is the life force or the vital energy. And there's two contrasting forms of chi, which are your yin and your yang and the imbalances, uh, that, that you get in yin and yang, just imbalances in the body are what cause disease in a patient. So uh, an easy way to think about it is like your, your yin and yang is like your AC unit for your body, your mm-hmm. thermostat, and you can, you know, your heater can either be broken. So you have a deficiency or it can be working in overdrive and you have an excess and the same thing for your, your cooling your AC, it could be broken. So you have a deficiency in that, or it could be working in overdrive and you have an excess. And so that kind of categorizes your diagnosis and really helps you to tailor that plan for the patient. And then in terms of just kind of common things that are treated, definitely like, like pain, you know, osteoarthritis, muscle tenderness, disc diseases, neurologic, you know, type of, of pain disorders. Those are going to be your most common because it's, it, it is easy to kind of target and, and get that response that you need because acupuncture does relief almost like an opioid effect and endorphin, serotonin, stuff like that, that can really, really help with pain, but it's not limited to that. I mean, you can treat anything because you can diagnose it that way. It does become a little bit harder, you know, when you're talking about treating skin disorders and stuff like that, because you need to work on it a lot more and you need to really, really hone in and get that diagnosis. Um, but it, it doesn't discriminate. It can treat pretty much anything that Western medicine can treat. Okay. So you said there's 20 points. Does each point have, 
how do I word this? Does each point have an affiliation with like, oh, if it's this point, it's something with gum disease. If it's this point, it's neurological. Or is it, or is it different how the points work? Well, so there's actually way more than 20 points. <laughs> okay. That's what we had to, we had to be able to, our test like was like, okay, here's 20 points at random out of the 200 plus points that exist. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's, yeah, there's tons of points. Um, they, they all um, lie on um, a, a specific meridian, which is going to be named after a certain organ in Chinese, me- uh, Chinese vet medicine. And there's 12 regular meridians. So <laughs> there, there's tons of points. And that's what is, is so, I mean, great about it. You, you can really, really tailor that, that treatment because you have so many options. And yes, your the point is absolutely going to be something that you, you're taking your diagnosis and this point is going to be good for that. So, I mean, it can be as simple as this point is good for the blockage of chi that we, you know, that is associated with pain and it's going to help relieve pain at this area. And it can also be, you know, this point is, is good for the liver. This point is good for this disorder. This point is good for this patient. It, it, it varies widely and it all comes down to that, that diagnosis. Okay. So normally, uh, whenever owners are coming to see you, are they coming specifically for particular issues? Like in my case, I sought out my first acupuncturist, uh, for cancer, which is kind of a vague topic because there's a lot of things that come with cancer, of course. And then after that, um, I sought out the acupuncturist for just, old age. And I hate to say it like that, but essentially my dogs were getting older. I could tell they were starting to slow down. Things weren't moving the same way. So I guess you could say pain is sort of the reason that I went back the the other time with my other two dogs. But um, when people come to you, are they like, Hey, can you help me? My dog is limping or what do you normally see that manifestation look like? So the, I mean, geriatric care is, is, really, really high up there because you oftentimes become limited in Western medicine on what you can do for your geriatric patients. You know, their, their liver and kidneys may not be functioning as top notch as they used to. And some of the the medications are going to be a little bit harsher on them that can really help to relieve that. And that's where, you know, our our Eastern medicine can come into play because it's going to be a lot more gentle on, on the body. And it's going to be about restoring imbalances or restoring balance and, and getting rid of imbalances. So that, that is, is probably a, a number one that's really, really high up there, but it's not, you know, it's, it's something that we can do for any age if, if it needs it, but overall quality of life is, is going to be kind of, kind of one of the ones that we, we really see high up there. And, yeah, can, you can think that pain is going on, but you could also have some muscle weakness that's attributing to things. So you might have an idea of what's wrong with your dog and seek out the, the veterinary acupuncturist for that reason and end up, you know, getting treated for a whole nother. Mm-hmm. So it, it takes into account everything that is, is causing what you're seeing in the dog and then therefore restoring the balance. Are there ever cases where a dog is just not a good candidate for acupuncture? Sure. Yeah, there, there's definitely, I mean, you know, not every dog in the world is going to understand why you're poking it with needles mm-hmm. and is, is not necessarily going to tolerate that. And, and that's okay. It might be that, that, that acupuncture is just not for them. And, and you go for the other modalities, but you can also think about doing some other types of, of stimulation at those points, you know, there's, um, I know we talked about the electro stimulation where we just kind of hook up. It's kind of like a TENS unit. Um, not that necessarily that's good for, for those particular patients, but we also have other options like aquapuncture where you take, um, just something that's pretty benign that can be injected. Um, a lot of times I'll use B12. You can also use just, just anything that's going to be, you know, not going to really cause any, any type of, not a medication or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can do a quick injection of that and it'll stimulate the point for about 20 minutes, but you don't have a needle standing there and you don't have it hooked up to electro that, you know, this dog is not necessarily going to tolerate. Sometimes you can get like, you know, six to 10 quick points in there if they tolerate that. And that's great. 
Other options would be using the laser or using even just your, your hand to stimulate pressure. That's not a, a needle. Um, moxibustion is, is also an option if you're not gonna use it directly on a needle, which is just kind of the, it's the, the burning of a certain herb. It's kind of like a, a small spongy herb. It smells a lot like another type of herb, <laughs> but it is not. Um, I know a lot of people will be like, man, what's going on in that veterinary clinic? But yeah. It's box of vegetables. Um, and you don't necessarily have to touch the dog. You just put that herb kind of burning really, really closely to the point and it can stimulate it. So there are plenty of, of options if the dog will tolerate it. But no, not every dog is going to tolerate needles. And, and that's okay. We definitely take it into account. So is my understanding correct that the what is it called? They have a name for it. They essentially do a test spot, like kind of on the head. And depending on the dog's reaction, it might be a no-go from the, like from right then and there, or it might be a, Hey, let's try out a few more. Yeah. So the, the permission point. Yes. That's <laughs> um, what it's called. Yeah. Yes. It's the one right at the top of the head. Um, and it's a calming point. And we, a lot of times will do that one to just kind of see how they tolerate it and also to kind of get them calmed down. Um, there's another point right behind the ear called unshin that I really like to use that I'll use the aquapuncture for if I know a patient is particularly wound up that I'll, I'll use that. Um, sometimes they, they don't like love that injection at the beginning, mm -hmm. but once they get it, in and then after that the patient is a lot more relaxed for their session and we have a great session so um but yeah the permission point is is a good tool to use to kind of test out you know how's this dog going to react to to me doing some needles in this body <laughs> right so as it relates to that permission point and this kind of goes back to what you were talking about other modalities one of our dogs titan um he he won't allow the needles so what they do is and you're probably going to know the correct terms for this, but essentially they laser the different points rather than doing the needle. Um, it seems to be a little bit quicker than like putting the needle in, leaving that for 20 minutes. So can you explain what that modality is as far as like the laser in the certain points? Yeah. So it's using the, the cold laser, or the therapeutic laser, which we use for a lot of, of painful conditions. It helps with inflammation, helps promote healing. You don't necessarily need to use it for acupuncture only. It's used for other things too. We really like to use it with our acupuncture patients, especially those geriatrics, especially those, you know, bulging discs, arthritis, all, all of that. Um, but what they're doing in that instance is they're taking the laser and they're honing in on specific acupuncture points and they're stimulating the point with the laser as opposed to using a needle there. And so it makes sense that it is a little bit quicker because you're just stimulating the one point for a little bit and then you're moving on to the next point as opposed to your typical acupuncture session where you put all of your needles in and the points that you want stimulated. Um, I would say it, it varies, but anywhere, depending on the patient, probably 10 to 20 needles, maybe more, mm -hmm. maybe less. Um, and then you're hooking up the, the electro simulation and then you're letting that sit for about 15 to 20 minutes. So it is a little bit longer when you're using the needles. Okay. And then what other modalities do you guys normally combine? We, and we've touched on this kind of throughout, but so for us, I think that we might use two different lasers at our vet, uh, maybe one that goes on certain points and then perhaps one that's just for inflammation generally. I don't know. I could be wrong. Um, we do that. And then, like I said, we do the physical therapy. And I know our vet also has like a um, underwater treadmill, which my dogs would hate. So obviously they don't do that ever. No, I'm right. and, I <laughs> yeah. And I think that they have a few other things that they do there. And then they do prescribe different herbs and stuff. But in your practice, what do you normally combine with the acupuncture to get the best outcome? So, so far in my practice, I, I have used the acupuncture and the laser only, but there are plenty of other modalities. Like we don't have an underwater treadmill. Would love to get one one day. That's, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that physical therapy you can use, I mean, there's on the ground where you, it's a lot like, like humans where, you know, we're using medicine balls and stairs and fun little, you know, activities, um, to help build muscle or help a patient use a leg that maybe they just had surgery on or that they have a condition that can't have surgery and we need to strengthen it. Um, those, that physical rehabilitation is, so yeah, actually you were supposed to use physical rehabilitation as opposed to physical therapy, but it oh, right. that physical therapy is in, in humans and the underwater treadmill is great for that as well as the, the on land, you know, um, therapies that we have. Um, the laser, like we said, is, is a great one. Um, for the, the Chi Institute where I got my acupuncture certification, there's four different certifications you can get that kind of encompass practicing traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, and it's going to be your acupuncture. And then Tui Na, which is medical manipulation, um, not quite like chiropractic, it's more kind of like massage. And then there's food therapy, and then there's herbal. So those are going to be the four that encompass traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. And if you get all four of those certifications, you're absolutely going to be an advantage of being able to use all those modalities to best help your patient. That's another goal of mine <laughs> right now. I'm oh, in okay. food therapy. So we're, we're getting there. <laughs> what, so what is food therapy? Because it sounds like when I get pizza to make myself feel better. So it's gotta be different for dogs. <laughs> So a little, a little bit different. Yes. It, it is designed to make the, the patient feel better. Um, but I can't say that pizza is on the list um, of, <laughs> of, um, of foods that we, we go for. Um, but it's it essentially goes back to the, the traditional Chinese veterinary medicine diagnosis and that excess and deficiency and what foods you can feed the body to help balance that. You know, there's going to be different foods some that are, are more cooling and some that are more warming. And that all, all goes back to, to using those to help restore balance. That makes sense because uh, my last uh, appointment, they asked me what protein source the dogs were on. And I think what we were getting at, and we didn't dig into it um, because it's, it's chicken, which I think is like pretty common. Uh, but I think that what we were striving toward was maybe – turkey um because turkey has l-tryptophan right and it helps like kind of calm you down and like kind of helps with aggression yes got that that thanksgiving <laughs> turkey yeah. you know to <laughs> give you give yeah. you the relaxation that you need <laughs> right yeah so i think that's kind of the path that we're actually about to go down is like that food therapy the issue is one of my dogs has a very very sensitive stomach so one different piece of kibble and he's off for days so I don't know if we can switch our protein sources, but I think that that's like our next conversation. And who knows? I mean, like we said, it, it's all about imbalances and you might even find that going down that food therapy route will help you to, to help with stomach too. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's going to be a goal of it because you're not just treating one thing. You're, you're treating a whole patient. Right. So if anyone is listening to this and they've maybe thought about taking their dog to acupuncture what are some telltale signs that they should definitely come in and see you or someone that does what you do? Well, <laughs> that's about anything. I mean, you, you can't go wrong. You know, there's, this is, it's a very safe modality is, is what's so great about it too. So if anything seems off with your dog and you really want to take an approach that kind of considers the, the patient as, as a whole, instead of just kind of honing in on this one thing, I mean, this is the route to go and you, you can't go wrong. You know, you're, you're going to be helping in some sense to, to get your dog feeling healthier, whether it be pain, whether it be he's old and you just don't think he, you know, he or she is, is quite moving around the, the way that they used to. Um, or even if you, you've got something going on that, you know, is, is for a younger dog, but it's GI issues and you just can't seem to get a hold of, of what's going on or how you can make them feel better. You know, a lot of times acupuncture and, you know, using all of these modalities, um, we can help. Okay. Awesome. And then uh, related to your point of younger dogs, is there 
a minimum age that you like to see before a dog comes in to even for a consult with an acupuncturist? Well, I mean, of course, you, you know, we all want to see the, the patients when, when they're puppies, right? <laughs> but even no, just, just because you get to, to know that patient through, throughout the entirety of its life. I mean, getting, knowing the history and, and knowing, you know, what, what all it has gone on with that patient throughout its lifetime is, is really helpful and can help us to, to help your pet more. Um, but that being said, don't let that hold you back. You know, I'll, I'll take a patient in uh, 15 years old if I can help them. Um, but 15 months to 15 years, well, we take them all and we want to help them all and it can. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. We're thinking about taking our two-year-old to the acupuncturist. And it's funny because I found myself even being like, well, he's, he's so young. But then <laughs> yeah. I took a step back and I said, that has nothing to do with acupuncture and what it can help with. Cause it can help with anything. And he has behavioral problems, uh, which is how we ended up with him. <laughs> uh, of course. So, so he probably needs to go. And yeah, that's one, that's one. actually one of the more common things that, that it, I know we didn't list it off as, as in that category of like pain, but behavioral problems is, is really high up there, honestly, with, with what it can treat herbals can really help to, you know, if he, he tends to be one that doesn't tolerate the needles as well. There's plenty of other modalities that can help. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Haley. We really appreciate it. And um, is there any more advice that you can give to the listeners before we sign off? Um, I just say, you know, <laughs> pay attention to your dog. The more the more questions that that we can get answered, the the better we can help your pet and treat your vets with kindness and your vet staff with kindness. We we all need it right now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Of course, you're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.